The Denver Broncos find themselves battle-tested with a star defensive player out of the lineup for the entire 2021 NFL season. Who will replace him? Not to mention it is Broncos mailbag. We have some great questions from Broncos country. Whether or not should Teddy Bridgewater be benched by the Denver Broncos? We break it all down on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team every day from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, joined alongside my co-host, Sarah Bettinger. Both of us cover the Denver Broncos for the Lockdown Network and Nine News. Make sure you follow and subscribe on your favorite audio podcasting platform. Subscribe here on YouTube so you can get us every single day Denver Broncos daily content and coverage. Hit the subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss out on all the actions. And thank you so much for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day. Sarah, my friend, it's great to see you here once again. Obviously, some time has has passed between the Broncos' loss to the Raiders, but not a lot of time to dwell on it, as now preparation for the Cleveland Browns has begun. My friend, can't wait to talk about it with you here today. It's exciting, and we get to get to erase the thought of that loss and move on to another game. And you're right, and there's no rest for the weary here. It's time to get back at it. It's time to push that loss out of the mind, time to press forward, and, and time to get excited about another game. No, no time to be cynical right now. I mean, we gotta, we gotta. Positive vibes. I feel like after three and zero, Cody, everybody was so negative about the three and zero start. You know, it's just like the players feel that. I feel like a little bit. The coaches feel that a little bit. So let's get some positive vibes going, Broncos country. Come on, get the get the players excited <laughs> with your positive vibes. Boom, positive vibes, man. You know, there ain't no rest for the wicked. Money don't grow on trees. I've got bills to pay. I've got mouths to feed. And there ain't nothing in this world for free, my friend. But outside of that, something that is going to cost, I think, a lot for the Broncos this season. Look, they already lost Josie Jewell to a torn pectoral muscle in the Jacksonville Jaguars game in week two. Now they have lost Alexander Johnson for the entire season after he tore his pectoral muscle in the team's loss on Sunday. And Sarah, I remember this play vividly. I had a great view of it. I was up close and personal for it. It was on one of the plays where he had to cover Kenyon Drake out of the backfield. I think they ran a swing route or an out route, and he rallied the tackle next to their sideline. But he grabbed, he extended his arm forward, and then the force pulled in. I immediately saw him go like this and grabbing his pectoral area, kind of his shoulder, and his teammates were asking him, like, hey, are you good? And he's like, yeah, he toughed it out. He played the rest of the half. Unfortunately, the end of the half ended in a touchdown catch by Kenyon Drake with Johnson and coverage on a wheel route, unfortunately. Uh, but his season is over, which is a big blow for the Broncos, considering. Inside backer has been a little bit of an issue for them this season since Josie Jewell has been out. Justin Sternad's a young guy, still learning, and he's growing every single week. He's doing a lot of really good things, but he's young. He hasn't fully grasped the entirety of this defense, and it takes time. And so now the Broncos, without their two starting inside linebackers, what is the overall impact, in your opinion, that this has on the defense as an entirety? I think in the short term, Cody, it's a little, a little bit of a worry, but at the same time, there's some contingencies in place, right? The Broncos did sign Micah Kaiser a few weeks back, and Micah Kaiser was a starting linebacker on the league's number one defense last year for nine games before he got hurt as well. So I think that there's something there that the Broncos have to work with. You got Micah Kaiser, you got Justin Sternad. Obviously, they had issues with, you know, they have issues against the run without Josie Jewell anyway. It'll be interesting to see what happens now without Alexander Johnson, who's arguably their better run defender of the two initial starters at inside linebacker. But over the long term, I think the impact of this injury is obvious. You have now an excuse to get Baron Browning on the field at some point in the season. And of course, Browning's not going to play in this upcoming game against the Cleveland Browns due to a concussion, but I think it now gives you an opportunity to see what you've got. Injuries always pave the way for somebody, you know, whether it was Josie Jewell at one point, whether it was Alexander Johnson at one point, and, and, and now it's the opportunity for Baron Browning to show this team why he deserves to be a player that they continue to build around going forward, and, and, and for Sternot as well, you know, he's got an opportunity here to really, he's going to wear the green dot, you know, he's going to call the plays defensively and in all likelihood. So I think that's another key that we talked about that in the preseason, getting to see him with those reps. So I think there's a lot of potential fallout from this that ultimately in the long term could benefit the Broncos. 
Uh, I think looking at it from both ways, too, I think it's a great growing experience here for Justin Sternod. I think it'll add a little bit more pressure to his plate, but pressure can be good. Pressure can create diamonds or it can cause you to fold. We'll have to see what happens here in this case, but it's also going to lead to the fact that the Broncos more than likely will have to call up a couple of practice squad guys, whether it be Barrington Wade or Curtis Robinson, undrafted rookie free agent out of Stanford. And then the Broncos, they brought in Peter Tomo Penu on Monday for a visit. Obviously, he spent time with the team in training camp, and then a couple weeks later, they released him, and then a couple weeks later, they brought him back for the practice squad and only lasted a day. Then he got cut again, and now he's being brought back in for a visit. But part of me is wondering, too, Andre Mintz dealt with a hamstring injury that could sideline him this week as well. And we know that he is one of the rotational guys in the pass rushing set, which unfortunately the Broncos pass rush in the last three weeks has not gotten home. So part of me is wondering, what is the Broncos' plans at inside backer and outside backer? Are you going to plan on maybe moving Jonathan Cooper to inside backer where he played a little bit in the preseason? He played both inside and outside, and then maybe have Peter Tomo Penu as that backup rush option at the pass rusher position. I mean, there's a multitude of things the Broncos can do. We have no idea what it may be, but throwing it out there, that is certainly a possibility. So Broncos country, let us know in your comment section down below on YouTube if you're watching or if you're listening on the podcast at Lockdown Broncos. Tweet us your thoughts on the Broncos' outlook right now at the inside backer position with the injury to Alexander Johnson out for the entire 2021 NFL season. Obviously, we hope for him to have a speedy recovery. We wish him the best, but now it puts the Broncos in a tough position where linebacker all of a sudden is going to become a need a little bit as free agency and the NFL draft will creep up eventually in the next you know six months or so for this organization. So something to keep an eye on there. But Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. We're going to get into a mailbag. We got some really great questions from the avid listeners all across Broncos country. One of them being about Teddy Bridgewater's future with the Denver Broncos specifically in the next couple of weeks, what it may look like. We answer that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about the sponsor. Today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. That is our good friends over there at McDonald's. And McDonald's has been proudly serving communities since 1965. And McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's been a place where friends and family can come to connect. And not to mention, it's a place where classmates can meet up. It's where friends, family, rivalries, sports fans can come to unite after a game to recharge and to refuel and win or lose, it is very important for everybody to come together. And that's one thing that McDonald's does really well. It's the place where you can always look forward to stopping on a long road trip to rest your legs and refuel. And for example, Wednesdays are my day off at Pro Football Network. And I have this habit of mine where I go to McDonald's in the morning. I get myself an egg McMuffin. I get a hash brown. I cut the hash brown in half. I put the hash brown inside the, the sausage McMuffin, sausage egg McMuffin. I stack it and I enjoy it. That's one of my Wednesday morning rituals. And we all have ours with McDonald's here today. Day. So head to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. And did somebody say that a lockdown Broncos watch party? Well, we could have one there. You never know, ladies and gentlemen. So go check it out today at your local McDonald's. ba da ba 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 sir. I'm loving it. All right, Broncos country, opening things up here with our Broncos country map. just want to say thank you so much for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day on your favorite audio podcasting platforms or here on YouTube in video format. If you have not yet subscribed here on YouTube, please do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and engage with us in the comment section down below. Love Broncos country being able to come to the comment section to vent, to talk, and debate and discuss, and keeping it civil, I think, is the always important thing here that sometimes gets lost, especially when a team is losing football games and everything seems like the sky is falling, which right now I think essentially it kind of feels like it's there. But look, hey, no time to dwell. Thursday night football matchup coming up here in just a couple of days. We'll have a crossover episode with Lockdown Browns host Jeff Lloyd here in the next day or so. But Let's get into our mailbag here. And Sarah, we got a great mailbag question here today. And I think it's a very good question considering how the Broncos have played the last three weeks. The question is, should the Denver Broncos bench Teddy Bridgewater if he and the offensive unit continues to struggle? I'm going to let you answer this one first. I'm eager for your thoughts on this. Well, Cody, I think it's a great question, actually. Uh, I, I think it's something that everyone in Broncos country is either thinking about or being super loud about, wondering it out loud on Twitter and everywhere that they've got a platform. It's definitely something that everyone starts to think about when the offense is playing badly. You obviously go straight to the coordinator and the quarterback first and foremost. Those are the two guys that everybody's pointing fingers at if the offense isn't playing well. And I think rightfully so. For the past couple of weeks, everybody's been pointing fingers at Pat Shermer. Now we're kind of starting to realize well, Teddy Bridgewater, four turnovers against the Las Vegas Raiders. Maybe he's got something to do with that. So it, it makes sense to me that the Broncos would at least be considering it. And unless Vic Fangio was just completely lying to all of us, right, when he made the decision to choose Teddy Bridgewater, I think he had to be telling the he, he either had to be telling the truth or, or, you know, maybe he was just pumping up Drew Locke with some fluff. But he said 
Cody, that that Drew Locke is somebody that he feels like this team can win with. He said, we have two quarterbacks that we feel like we can win with. And if that is accurate, if that's true, if he really believes that, then you've got to have a shorter leash for Teddy Bridgewater than, than many people might have thought going into this season. I don't think Teddy Bridgewater necessarily deserves many many games like we saw against the Raiders, that's for sure. And I think if you go into this game against the Cleveland Browns, effectively your season is on the line, right? You lose this game three and four, you lose to a yet another AFC playoff contender, especially with all the injuries that they have, you don't really have the opportunity to come back from that. And so I think Teddy Bridgewater, man, you look at the first and second quarter of this game, if he's playing badly, if he's turning the ball over, that's an opportunity for you to pull the plug and say, hey, it's Drew Locke time. We, we don't have any time to waste at, at this point. We've, we've lost three straight games. We're losing ground in playoff contention or po even the possibility of making it. So I think it's an interesting question. I'm eager to hear what you think, Cody, whether it's too soon, whether it's overdue. What do you think about the situation with Teddy Bridgewater possibly being benched? I, I think it's intriguing, uh, you know, considering where the Denver Broncos are at right now with the whole dilemma. Look, they're three and three. I mean, if, it feels like, and I understand our tone of talking sometimes, but just even like the vibe in Broncos country, it, it feels like this team is 0 and 6. But they're mm -hmm. three and three. And I think that there's still a lot of things that you can salvage in this season. Obviously, I think we have a, another question that'll be coming up that really kind of gives us some insights to maybe which path they could go to. But look, I, I think that if, if the offense continues to be stagnant, you need somebody. And look, I'm not saying that Drew Locke can come in and do a better job. And I was asked a question as well. What would the Broncos record be if Drew Locke had started the season? I, I still feel like right now they'd still be three and three potentially. That's that's kind of how I'm feeling. But I, I think that we don't know enough because we haven't seen enough yet just from each of these guys to say, oh, well, hey, this guy's going to do better than this guy. I can tell you one thing that the Broncos can probably do a little bit better with Drew. And as we know it, probably the play action stuff right now when they're running a lot of play action with Teddy. He's holding on to the ball too long. And he has his tendency to even pump fake sometimes after play action. So not to mention, you're under center. You snap the ball. You're going to do your fake to the running back. And it creates the issue where that takes about two, two and a half seconds off of the play clock as is. And then you have to stand in the pocket for an additional sometimes two to four seconds of what we're seeing Teddy do. And it's hurting your offensive line, in my opinion. And in my opinion, Sarah, I think the Broncos, in order to get play action going, you have to have a run game. And the Broncos just simply right now have not been committed to it. They've given up on it or they've had an, a, you know different circumstances impact their ability to want to do it. And like I said in the postgame report, the Broncos tied the game up 7-7 against the Raiders. They got the ball back. They had a chance. They were down 7-10. to Once they got the ball back, they kind of abandoned the run there, and they had that fourth and one, and they threw it, and it was an interception. And from that point forward, the run game sort of seemed a little bit non-existent after that, like the mm -hmm. emphasis to get it going because, okay, hey, now we're trailing. We're trailing by three points. We can't run the football right now. I, I think those are the things that kind of frustrate me here. So what could the Broncos maybe do better with Drew Locke? Well, obviously, I think taking your shots downfield, maybe play action because you you can roll Drew out to the right, but then again, there's no guarantee that Drew's going to do any better in this offense right now than Teddy. And I think a lot of it, yes, it's on quarterback, but as we said in the post game, it's also on the coordinator. And if the coordinator, if the scheme right now is outdated, we're really, it's simple concepts. We're not seeing any complexity here from the Broncos offense. We're not seeing any kind of emphasis that the Raiders do. If I were the Broncos, I would be using Noah Fant vertically and across the field. I'd be using him in those rooms. I'd be using the slot receivers, regardless of who it is. And I know Jerry Judy's not back yet, but I'd be using other guys to do plays that Hunter Renfro with the Raiders does. The Raiders, the way they run their offense, it exemplifies the modern NFL offense. The, the system that the Broncos are running with Pat Shermer, it's simply outdated. It's evident to see when you look at other West Coast style of offenses. I don't think there's any argument about that. So for me, Sarah, I, I don't know if any guy's going to give you a better shot, but you know what? If Teddy continues to play the way he is and it's a short passing game, you might as well see what you have with Drew Locke. I don't think it's going to hurt the Broncos. I mean, what what damage could it potentially do to them? I mean, obviously, Teddy I th you know, has been well regarded as a good leader, something Drew has to continue to grow and develop on, but he's not going to do it sitting on the bench. Might as well try to see what a guy can do. I'm not saying that Drew's going to be better than Teddy or anything like that, but hey, at this point, what do you have to lose if you're the Denver Broncos, Sarah? So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Exactly, exactly. It's It's been frustrating, like you mentioned. That's, that's the perfect word for it. It's been very frustrating. And speaking of frustrating injuries, Cody, I mean, oh, how, how many injuries have we had to talk about over the last two, three years, I don't even I don't even know how it's how long it's been. We've been talking about injuries, but somebody sent you a, a great question uh, that we were talking about before the show about soft tissue injuries, and I had to have you explain soft tissue to me because I'm thinking like 
So, you know, I, I don't even know what, what I was thinking. I'm no doctor, people, okay? I'm just a guy wearing a hat. We've talked about this before, okay? So, Cody, tell me about these soft tissue injuries. Do you think that there's been too many of them for the Broncos? And really what the question was getting at is, is this a reflection of the strength and conditioning staff? Yeah, this is a great question. I think that this is something that we saw a couple years ago get thrown out there. And then I feel like it's kind of been the low hanging fruit, but I think it, it peaks a very curious question. What's a soft tissue injury? Well, when you think of your quads, your hamstring, your glutes, uh, you can look at other things, your groin, those are considered soft tissue injuries, things that can heal, but will obviously take time. I, I think those are really the bigger issues, calf, calf issues as well. Those are soft tissue injuries. I don't necessarily think that there's a correlation between the injuries that the Broncos are sustaining and the strength and conditioning staff. I know it's easy to say, but you know these players, they'll work in the system on strength and explosiveness. I mean, those are two things you have to have on the day-to-day -day in the NFL when you're on the football field. I also think that when you look at it, I think Broncos country is way too close to it because we look at other teams. I mean, look at Cleveland, for example, how many players they put on their injury report on Monday. It was well over, I think, close to 20 players and most of them key starters that are dealing with injuries right now that put a lot of their question, uh, a lot of their status is into question for Thursday's matchup, but I, I think it's an issue widespread around the NFL, sir. I don't think it's just exclusive to the Denver Broncos. I think it feels that way because Broncos fans, that's the number one thing that they see and they hear about is players on the team that they root for, which, you know, I think there's evident reasons to be concerned. I think for me, sir, where I would be concerned about the strength and conditioning staff here for this football team would be if you rush a guy back from injury. Let's say Jerry Judy's not actually ready to return, and then you have that pressure to rush him back. If the medical staff rushes a guy back without him being ready, I would be very concerned. And also, too, you know, Lauren Landau and his staff, they'll go through and they'll test players pregame. They'll test them all throughout the week after practice, which Jerry Dewey is expected to do. Now, if there's any kind of thing where they rush him back, he's not ready. I feel like that's negligent. I think that's where you can have the issue and the argument that, hey, this is on the strength and conditioning staff. But the strength and conditioning staff's job is to continue to help provide any aid in the recovery from your game to games with alongside the Broncos medical staff, but also designing in season and out of season programs for strength and explosiveness. You have to factor this is a violent physical sport and you're playing it at 100 miles an hour. And a lot of times you're playing on artificial turf, which is a whole nother case study, a whole nother issue. The most explosive athletes in the world running, changing, cutting directions with cleats that get stuck in those surfaces deeper. And that's where you see all these non contact injuries. So it's much bigger than the Broncos strength and conditioning staff. But I also think it's also on the NFL and player safety. They say they value it, but Sarah, I personally don't feel it because you're having a game on on Sunday and you're forcing players to come in and this is not for just the Broncos. I'm not griping about that. I'm griping this for all 32 teams. You're having them come in three and a half days later to play a game on Thursday night. In my opinion, the NFL does not care about player safety. That is the bigger issue here outside of anything else. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that, my friend. But Broncos Country coming up here in just a moment. We have a couple more mailbag questions that Broncos Country sent in. We're going to answer those coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about the two other sponsors of today's episode of the show. That's a good friends over there at Beachbound and Rock Auto. In line we're all bound for different things with beachbound.com vacations. You could be bound for adventure. You could be bound for passion, bound for discovery, or bound for togetherness, immersion, or bound for rejuvenation. Or you may be bound for encountering the unexpected. And personally, when I'm at a beach resort, I'm bound to end up at the poolside bar, maybe creating my own taco flight. And as long as I've got a good view and a good drink in my hand, I'll be happy as can be. With beachbound.com, you can find the perfect beach vacation for you and your loved ones, no matter what you were looking for. What are you bound for? Visit Beachbound.com today. And our good friends are there, rockauto.com. And ladies and gentlemen, if you need anything for your vehicle, rockauto.com has everything that you could be looking for. If you need something to restore in a project that you're working on in the garage, or if you just need something for your day-to-day -day driver, rockauto.com is the perfect website for you here today. And you don't have to spend an arm and a leg anymore at local auto parts stores when you have rockauto.com. And prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low, whether you're a professional or do it yourself, or you can browse through catalog to see all the parts available for your car based on year make, model, brands, specifications, and even the prices that you prefer so you never have to spend too much more on things that you need for your vehicle ever again. RockAuto.com has you covered. So go to RockAuto.com right now to see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, Lockdown Broncos in there. How did you hear about us, Box, so that they know that we sent you? Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. 
Com. All right, Sarah, as we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode of Lockdown Broncos, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country that continues to listen into the podcast and helping us grow. We appreciate you spending time out of your day to listen to us as your first listen of the day, not to mention to watch us and interact with us here on YouTube and social media. But Sarah, my friend, we got a couple more mailbag questions we got to get to today, and I got a very interesting one. And I like to look at this from a multitude of angles, being a defensive back guy, but the question was, what is the solution for the Denver Broncos secondary to help kind of rectify allowing some of these big plays, the explosive plays downfield that we've seen the last three weeks? It's a tough, it's a tough one, right? That's been one of the hardest things to watch all year is that super high price secondary giving up big, big plays in the passing game one week after another. I mean, of course, they figure out in most of these games, they've figured out ways to kind of tighten it up after giving up those big plays. Like against the Jacksonville Jaguars, for example, they had that first drive where it just looked like the Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence were going to throw all over that secondary all game. And then they came back and they just really shut it down. But then there's games like the game against the New York Jets where the stats look really good. But in reality, you know, Zach Wilson hit a lot of these throws that the receivers just simply dropped. So it, it seems to me like things are going down a really negative path for this unit right now. It's hard for me to tell Cody if it's miscommunication, if it's certain players like like Darby uh, who's coming in or, or even Fuller who had three years away from Vic Fangio. If those guys are coming in and if they're not communicating well on the back end and then you got Justin Simmons coming up over the top like on the Henry Ruggs touchdown against the Raiders, that first touchdown of the game, well, on the TV the TV angle, Cody, it looks like Justin Simmons made a huge mistake on that play, but you and I were talking. That's not that's not necessarily the case. Justin Simmons is just so athletic that he's able to recover from his initial assignment to get over and be somewhere else to at least try and help. So, of course, it, it's it's tough to assess individual blame when you're talking about an individual unit, but as a, as a secondary member yourself, Cody, What's the issue with the Broncos right now, scheme-wise? Is it is it the players communicating? What does it look like to you? Well, you know, I think it's a combination of what the offense that they're going against is doing, but also them and, and their ability to disguise. I mean, we talk about it all the time. The Broncos love to look and come out in a too, too high safety look. But on that specific play, the first touchdown to Henry Ruggs, I see a lot of people blaming Justin Simmons for it. But here's the deal. The Broncos are in that too high safety look. If I'm the offensive perspective, I'm Derek Carr, I'm looking to the right. Justin Simmons is to my right from the offensive perspective perspective. Kareem Jackson's to the left. Well, guess who's on the left? It's Darren Waller. And guess what? When you're a man in that situation, Darren Waller is the number two guy. You have your number one guy on the outside, which is Ruggs, which Ronald Darby has man-to-man -man coverage on. And then you have to respect that Darren Waller's there. So guess what? You're going to roll down Kareem Jackson to cover Waller, which means that Simmons, who's on the all the way on the right side, who's protecting against the other formation with Brian Edwards and Hunter Renfro, he has to rotate to center field here. And from where he is at against one of the speediest guys in the NFL, he has to get to that middle. And so a lot of people are mad at him for that, but the reality is it's just not a good play concept. And there was a, something out there, the CBS broadcast that said that Justin Simmons was was talking, having words with the coaching staff. And I think a lot of it too is he's frustrated because he's the leader of the defense what they're asking him to do versus disguise versus where you can get, it's a lot against a lot of speed that you have to go to. And hats off to Greg Olson, the offensive coordinator here for the Las Vegas Raiders. They did a really good job of exploiting the Broncos in those areas. And we talked about in the postgame report, the issues that you're having right now with not getting a lot of pass rush here from Von Miller, Malik Reed, Draymond Jones, Shelby Harris, Mike Purcell, you're not, you're not getting a lot of that pressure. It's not coming home. You have young guys at the linebacker position that teams are attacking in the passing game. What do you expect from the secondary here? Now, I don't think that the Broncos necessarily had any busted coverages in the Raiders' loss. However, you saw unexecuted type plays. Ronald Darby it happened on that one. Look, Henry Ruggs just ate up his cushion really quick. He learned how fast he was, and we know that uh, Ronald Darby is a very fast guy. There was another play downfield. There's one that Vic Fangio had challenged. He goes to play the hip. He just goes up to jump to try to hit the ball, and he doesn't come anywhere close to the ball. So on that one, you have to understand, when do I play the ball versus when do I play the receiver? These are fundamental errors that are happening, but Justin Simmons is finding himself as the key guy that everybody in Broncos country is blaming. But the reality is he's had to overcompensate a lot for some of the issues that Ronald Darby and Kyle Fuller have made in the last couple of weeks. So I think that it really goes back to the fact that 
what Justin said last week. No offense to, to the fan base, but they have no idea what the coverage is. They don't know what Justin's real responsibility is. And that's something that was pinpointed out there. I mean, even Vic mm-hmm. Fangio and Justin Simmons said what happened on that play. And so it's like people don't want to believe that. But, you know, yeah. I think that that's the bigger issue here for this Broncos football team is that it's easy right now to point the blame and point your fingers at so many different guys. But at the end of the day, you know, you go back and you watch the tape, you can see a lot of these things for yourself. You just have to see it and you have to process. You have to study enough to know, hey, okay, hey, I know what I'm looking at here the Broncos run a lot of man to one side and they'll run zone to the other side and so much of that is contingent upon what is the number two receiver doing is he dragging across the field if so it might have to change the demand for this guy who's necessarily got a hook to curl zone it is complex I think that maybe the Broncos the solution sir Maybe the Broncos secondary, maybe Vic Fangio has to get with the KISS method, the keep it simple, stupid method for the next couple of weeks because it's very complex. Now you have a lot of new players, specifically an inside linebacker, guys who aren't familiar totally with the defense coming in and having to call it. The secondary will look a lot worse if they don't simplify it. And I think that's a really big issue, Sarah. But the last question we're going to get here in our mailbag here today, what are the two paths for the Denver Broncos if they win this game on Thursday against the Browns or if they lose? There's two different trajectories. Which road will they follow? Boy, I love it. I love a good what scenario great great uh great show marvel put out there i think a lot more more companies should do it by the way but for the denver broncos this week man it's it's a it's a big time difference between these two different paths and of course you don't want that on a short week right let's start off with the negative what if they lose this game i mean that would be four straight losses not only four straight losses it would be four straight losses against key afc opponents that will make a difference in the in the long run if you if you are actually able to win nine games or ten games or whatever. I mean, that would obviously be far fetched at that point. But if that's able to happen and you've lost these four straight games, those th- those losses will be detrimental. So if you lose this game, your morale is going to be low. You're pro- you're possibly I can't say probably, but you're possibly looking at Pat Shermer possibly being fired at, at that point. You're possibly looking at the the thing we talked about before with Teddy Bridgewater being replaced. I mean, not to not to overreact to it's it, it would in the grand scheme of things it would be one loss, but it be it would be one out of four straight. Uh, I think it would be just it would be catastrophic in my opinion, Cody. If the Broncos lose this game, we'll talk about this on a later episode of the show. But man, I, you could be looking at being sellers at the trade deadline. That's going to be ten days in between four straight losses and your next game. I mean. Just think about the fan base that we're going to be speaking with and speaking to during that time. Everybody's going to be up in arms over basically this bye week after four straight losses. But man, there there is an opportunity to win this game. You can still go out and do it. So what's your thoughts on this, Cody? What if it goes the other way? What if they come out and they're able to win this game? Well, I can see it from multi years. I thought your, your touch on what would happen maybe if they lose, I think it's spot on. I, I resonate with that a lot. But if the Broncos win, I mean, you're going to see the excuses, right? You're going to see the narrative that, well, the Broncos beat a team that is really banged up. But if they lost, you know, it'd be the same thing. Well, they lost. They, they couldn't even beat a team that was really banged up. So it's like you can never win in these situations. But look, I don't think you you can look at these, these games like that. If you win, that's great. It goes well for you because now if you win, that gives you a one game above 500 for the organization and it also gives you a, you know some momentum heading into a matchup look you're going to get 10 days off but it's going to give you momentum heading into a matchup against the Washington football team that's banged up right now but they have to come on the road on Halloween to play the Denver Broncos going back to what you said one two Jerry's coming for you I think that is huge man I would love that uh, for the Denver Broncos that'll be the motto of the week if that's the case but Sarah I, I think that the roads can lead to different ways now obviously as the Broncos keep winning it's going to improve their record it's going to improve their positioning Still, they're just about one and a half games away from the top spot in the AFC West. So I understand things just from the optics side of how they played. It's been bad. I mean, they they play like they're the last place team in the AFC West, which right now they're currently not at. But you can maybe make the case that could be there. They're tied for last right now. But I think that where the Broncos are at there, this win could propel them to maybe getting some good changes back. And obviously, as you get Jerry Judy back, it amplifies a little bit more. But, Sarah, I, I, I don't want to be pessimistic here. I do think that until the Broncos' offense changes, not much will change with this football team, sadly enough. And Broncos country, I'm eager to hear your thoughts on that in the comment section down below. What do you think of the mailbag questions that were sent in? Do you believe that the Broncos, a win on Thursday, could propel them through the rest of the season, even though the t- schedule does get a lot tougher? What do you think a loss does? Let us know in the comment section down below. We'll interact with you here on YouTube. 
Make sure you hit that subscribe or that follow button on your favorite audio podcasting platform and YouTube. And we just want to say thank you so much for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day. For your second listen, go check out Lockdown Nuggets, who open their season up on Wednesday against the Phoenix Suns. And that's going to be a good rematch from the playoffs. Adam Adams, Matt Moore had to cover Becerra. My friend, great seeing you as always. Can't wait to bring it with you tomorrow to talk Denver Broncos football. Practice, it's a walkthrough tomorrow with a one-step poster for a game on Thursday against the Cleveland Browns.